Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining AFA's webinar, Asthma and the Triple Demic. We have a wonderful program for you today and we can't wait to share it with you. Before we dive in, I would like to tell you a little bit about AFA and who we are. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America aims to be a trusted ally of the asthma and allergy communities. We are dedicated to saving the lives and reducing the burden of diseases through support, advocacy, education, and research. Without you, our community, we wouldn't be here. So thank you so much for everything that you do for those everywhere with asthma, allergies, and other related conditions. My name is Stacy, and I am the public health manager here at AFA, and I am so happy to be your host for the program. Your speaker, who you will meet in just a moment, is Dr. John James. Also, we have a staff member ensuring that everything runs smoothly on the back end, ready to answer your questions. Her name is Zulima, and she is our support center manager. You will meet her later on in the program. Now, let's go over some house rules before we begin. Everyone's video and audio are on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box that you see on your screen. All questions will be received through our chat and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. So please ask as many as you would like. There will be resources posted in the chat as well, also videos that you can look at at a later time. Lots of opportunities to participate in today's programming through polling questions and more. Today, let's go over what we'll be discussing. We will be talking about asthma and the triple demic diving into what a triple demic means and its effects on those living with asthma and related conditions. We're going to talk about the disparities of the disease, what those with asthma should be on the lookout for, and finally, the steps you can take in preventing uh, contracting a viral infection. At the end of the presentation, we're also going to take some time to answer any questions you may have sent in and any questions you may have from the program itself. Our speaker today is Dr. John James. Dr. James is a board certified allergist. He is also president of the Food Allergy Consulting and Education Services. He has worked as a medical specialist in the field of allergy, asthma, and immunology for over 30 years. Dr. James received his bachelor's degree from the University of Arkansas and his doctor of medicine degree from the University of Tennessee. He is board certified by the American Board of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and Dr. James is no stranger to AFA. He has led numerous webinars and other educational initiatives and many of his own. So without further ado, please welcome your speaker, Dr. John James. Dr. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stacey, for that introduction. And I wanna thank the Allergy and Asthma Foundation of America for having me as a speaker today. And finally, I wanna thank all the attendees today who took time out of their busy days to come on for this uh, webinar. So let's jump right in and talk about asthma facts. Approximately 25 million people in the United States have asthma. This equals about one in 13 people. Asthma is a leading chronic disease in children affecting about 5.1 million children under the age of 18. About 20 million United States adults age 18 years and older have asthma as well. Asthma rates are highest in black adults in the United States. And finally, black children are nearly three times more likely to have asthma compared to white children. Next slide again. So what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic lung disease that causes your airways to become swollen, making it hard to breathe. There is no cure for asthma but asthma can be managed successfully by avoiding asthma triggers, taking asthma medications to prevent and control symptoms, and finally, to treat asthma episodes when they occur. So this illustration will help to, to show you what happens in the airway both in a normal individual and those with asthma. On the left side, this is a depiction of a normal airway. The two airway tube is wide open. The lining of the tube is healthy. 
there's no mucus in the airway or increased mucus. And at the very end, those air sacs are normal. In the middle um, airway, this is an, a patient with asthma and there is increased in the mucous membrane, the inflammation, there can be mucus in the airway and the air sacs can, can be enlarged because air is not able to go through the lungs as easily as in the normal airway. And finally, in the asthmatic airway during an attack, there's many things happening. The mucosa or the lining of airway is very inflamed and enlarged, uh, restricting the airflow. There can be inflammation in the lining from, from asthma. And then these, this smooth muscle around the tube is tightened. So that restricts the airflow uh, through the to the into the lungs and those air sacs at the end get get uh, uh, dilated because the air is not able to move in, in and out of the lungs properly. So three main changes to the airways uh, shown here. Number one, there's swelling inside the airway. Number two, there's excess mucus clogging the airways plus swelling of the tubes or the air, airways. And number three, there's tightening and squeezing of the small smooth muscle around the airway. Also, I wanted to mention that increased airway hyperreactivity or hyperresponsiveness is a hallmark of asthma. And this means that the airway in an asthmatic patient is overreacted to certain triggers like viral infections, allergens in the air, um, uh, also to irritants in the air like pollution, and, and, and other irritants like tobacco smoke. So the airway is hyperreactive, it overreacts to these triggers. Next slide. So what does the triple dimic mean? There's no specific scientific uh, definition, of, definition of the triple dimic. What it refers to simply is the presence of COVID-19, influenza, and RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, seasons occurring at the same time, but not always peaking at the same time. All three viruses can be present at the same time, usually in the fall, starting in the fall, throughout the winter seasons, hence the name triple demic. Next slide. So we'll transition into talking a little bit about each viral infection. Next slide. So COVID-19, you're all familiar with this. Um, this uh, virus, the coronavirus, is responsible for the recent pandemic that started in 2020 and is still problematic at the current time. There are different variants that have been identified that can affect all age groups. The most common variant right now is what's called XBB 1.5, and this is involved in 60% of the cases right now in February of 2023. Since the pandemic started and through the current time, there have been a total of 102 million cases in the United States and a rate of about 280,000 cases per week. This is really uh, staggering. The, death, the deaths have been a oh, oh, little over a million deaths with about 3,500 deaths per week. So deaths about a 1% of the total cases and an average of about 3,500 new hospitalizations per day. Next slide. So then there's influenza. You're all familiar with influenza. This is um, a common viral illness that comes each year in the fall. It's, uh, it's known as the flu and it's mainly present uh, fall and winter, very common viral infection. During 2021 through 2022, influenza season, the Centers for Disease Control estimates revealed 9 million illnesses caused by influenza, 5.8 million medical visits, and 6% of these were affecting asthmatic patients, 1.2 million ER visits in patients with asthma who have been infected with influenza, and about 10,000 hospitalizations and approximately 5,000 deaths per year. So this is a very significant uh, illness that can have mortality. Next slide. So respiratory syncytial virus or RSV in the United States. This is a common, highly contagious virus, mainly affecting children, but also affecting adults. 
the total infection rate of RSV infections across the country in 2022, approximately 2.1 million outpatient cases among children less than five years of age, up to 80,000 hospitalizations in that age group, and 100 to 300 deaths in children less than five years of age. On the other hand, um, in patients greater than 65 years of age, an estimated uh, hospitalizations of 60,000 to 120,000 and 6,000 to 10,000 deaths among adults. I think this year um, I've seen more and more in the media and, and, and conversations about RSV affecting adults because we a lot of people just think it affects infants. Next slide. So, triple dimic and asthma. Viruses are one of the most common triggers for asthma. And today we're sp speaking about COVID-19, influenza, and RSV, but there can be other viruses you may know about, like para-influenza, um, rhinovirus, adenovirus. These cause flare-ups, or what are known as exacerbations of asthma. They can lead to increased visits to outpatient clinics, the emergency room, and in some cases, hospitalization, and as we mentioned earlier, there can be fatalities. There are early detection or early detection of signs and symptoms of asthma worsening is very important. We're going to speak about uh, signs and symptoms later. Good asthma control is so important, and we're going to speak a lot about asthma action plans in this regard. And finally, prevention measures are important not only prevention measures for asthma exacerbations, but prevention measures to keep from getting a viral illness and spreading that viral illness. So we do wanna speak a little about, about disparities. You know, many of you will be familiar with this. It's a really hot topic in a lot of areas right now. Health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Common examples of health disparities in the United States include asthma, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and heart disease. There are other conditions, but these are, these are make the main health disparities. Next slide. So key information about disparities are outlined on this slide. First of all, health disparities exist based on these factors, race, ethnicity, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender and gender expression, geography, disabilities, and citizen status. Secondly, health disparities, these are the things that are measured with health disparities, mortality, life expectancy, burden of disease, mental health, uninsured or underinsured, and lack of access to care. So in these different populations, these are what are measured, differences in mortality, differences in burden of disease. So the asthma triple-demic and disparities, obviously we're focusing on asthma today, and asthma is a common example of a health disparity affecting one group of people differently than another group. The burden of asthma in the United States falls disproportionately on Black, Hispanic, and African-American Indian, Alaskan, Native people. These groups have the highest asthma rates, hospital stays, and deaths from asthma. Next slide. So this is a complex slide. Uh, this was developed by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and it's a framework for root causes of asthma disparities. I'll walk through this. On the far left side, race and ethnicity. We talked about that earlier. And then this, this first box are called structural determinants, such as racism, discrimination, social, economic, and political context are very important, policies, governance, and culture. And the, the next box is called social economic status. This is so very critical for disparities like education level, economic status, and stability. And then the next uh, hatched blue line box is social determinants what's going on in the environment, physical, the actual physical environment that the individual lives in, as well as social environment. And then going moving to the right, there, there are biological factors, genetic factors, 
individual behaviors are critical. And this then leads to asthma outcomes. So in the bottom line there, the upstream factors are determinants of health disparities and to the far right are the determinants of health outcomes. Next slide. I like this slide because it summarizes in black, Hispanic and indigenous individuals in the United States, how they face the highest burden of asthma. These disparities are caused by those complex factors that we mentioned on the previous slide, systemic and structural racism. So compared to white Americans, black Americans are nearly one and a half times more likely to have asthma. Puerto Rican Americans, nearly two times more likely to have asthma. Black Americans are five times more likely to visit the emergency department due to asthma exacerbations. And black Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma. This is very significant. And to the far right, when sex is factored in, black women have the highest rates of death due to asthma. So many of you have seen this in the media or in publications, and, and, it's, and this is so important to understand there are disparities. And, and, and that can also be affected by these viral illnesses, the triple demic or individually with COVID. So those people who are having disparities might be more affected with those outcomes. So the exposure to COVID-19, influenza and RSV can negatively impact, Im impact patients with all forms of respiratory disease, not only asthma, but people with severe and uncontrolled asthma have very high risk. There are also uh, other diseases that can be impacted by respiratory infections, bronchiolitis, usually in children who have RSV, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and emphysema affecting older patients, those who have been smoking uh, for many years and have outcomes there. And then other diseases like cystic fibrosis. So here's the first polling question that we're gonna include in the presentation today. And this is, I have asthma, the triple demic is affecting me in this way. So you can select choices here. Please select all that apply. So we'll bring up a summary of the choices here. This is going to be really interesting to see how the audience is, is uh, making choices here. Okay. Thanks, Zulema, for bringing that up. So um, this, is, this is interesting. So there's a lot. It's pretty similar in all the choices. Shortage, shortage of medications, 34%. Long wait times, 30%, limiting activities, 43%, and it's not affecting me at all. So there's there's a there's a really similar choices here, very interesting. And the the top three there you can see are these are these are the major things people are dealing with. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So COVID-19 flu and RSV infections. We, we need to recognize typical signs and symptoms, and we'll list those uh, in, in following slides. And we'll have this really nice chart from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America that we'll go through as well. There are diagnostic tests available, rapid antigen detection testing, which a lot of these can be done at home. And there are other more sophisticated tests at, that can be performed at the hospital to identify if there is a certain viral infection like COVID-19 or influenza. And then we'll speak a little bit to treatment, symptomatic and specific therapies. So this is a very busy slide and I'll, I'll go through it. So it's looking at symptoms versus the different disorders that we're, we're talking about. So in the first column, it's the individual symptoms and then asthma, seasonal allergies or hay fever, coronavirus or COVID-19 infections, colds or upper respiratory infections, the flu or influenza, and then RSV. So I'll highlight some of these. Length of symptoms with asthma and seasonal allergies, these are gonna be longer lengths of problems. With asthma, can, you can have symptoms throughout the year. Seasonal allergies, it depends on what, if it's grass pollen versus weed pollen, it's gonna be different times of the year. And then with viral infections, they usually last a week to up to two weeks, sometimes up to a month. Cough is gonna be pretty common throughout all of these disorders. 
Uh, wheezing is mainly going to be seen with asthma and with RSV, so that might be a, a discriminating factor. Uh, chest tightness, we think more about asthma, chest pain and tightness. Think about asthmatics having those kind of symptoms. Um, sneezing, that's going to be more common with allergies, people with upper respiratory allergies, but can also be seen in individuals with upper respiratory infections and, and sometimes RSV. Sore throats with, with allergies, it's usually because of post-nasal drainage, but, and with viral infections, you can get sore throats, as you all know. Fever, now think about this more with viral illnesses, okay, but not necessarily with asthma or hay fever is kind of a misnomer or allergic rhinitis. So think about fever um, temperatures above 101 or so with viral illnesses. Um, headaches can be seen with um, with sometimes with hay fever, but can definitely be seen with viral illnesses. And body aches and pains for sure is going to be seen with the flu, with COVID, and with viral illnesses, not necessarily with asthma or allergic rhinitis. Interestingly, uh, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting is commonly seen with COVID-19. You may not think about that, but I certainly saw patients who just had GI symptoms with COVID and not respiratory symptoms. And finally, loss of taste and smell, a very common uh, side effect or finding in patients with COVID, but not with other disorders listed here. So I know it's a busy, busy slide. These, this is at the APA website. Could be very helpful to you and to your provider to have this, to discriminate these different disorders. Next slide. So what are the common signs and symptoms of asthma? Very common symptoms. These are sort of the classic common symptoms of asthma. Cough, wheezing, shortness of breath or rapid breathing, and chest tightness or pain. Other symptoms can be trouble talking, exercise intolerance, sleep disruption, and anxiety. Exercise intolerance is very important because about 80% of patients with asthma will have trouble with exercise. So it's called exercise-induced asthma or exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So that may be the one major uh, presenting factor to the clinic with someone who has asthma. And then we'll go through other symptoms seen in the individual viral illnesses, uh, in addition to typical asthma symptoms we mentioned previously. So with COVID-19, you can have fever, chills, fatigue, muscle aches, headaches, loss of smell and taste, sore throat, stuffy runny nose, and then those GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that's COVID-19. Influenza or the flu, typically a fever, headache, chills, fatigue, sore throat, stuffy nose, and these body aches. If you've ever had the flu, you know what I'm talking about. So that's flu, and then RSV, runny nose, sneezing, fever, bronchiolitis in infants, mainly infants under two, and this is a scary one, apnea and infants. This can happen where the, the infant just stops breathing and this can last for over 15 seconds. This is a very serious um, involvement with RSV. Next slide. So asthma and viral infections, how do we diagnose this? Well, clinically, it's usually with a present clinical history, it's with a physical exam and then uh, lung functions. But with these viral illnesses, we wanna take it a step further. Can we, uh, find out if it's COVID-19, influenza A or B. Certainly we can do that with rapid diagnostic testing. And many of you have done this in your homes because of the availability of these rapid tests. RSV, there's not a rapid test available. Other viral testing, some of you may have had testing done in the hospital with PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction, very sensitive and specific test that can be done to identify COVID-19, influenza or other viruses. And then lung function testing, looking at flow volume loops in the doctor's office, looking at obstruction versus restriction, looking at uh, how involved this might be is very helpful to uh, your, your provider and specialist to be able to make decisions about treatment. So the second polling question is here, where do you go for your healthcare information? Please select all that apply. So you can select more than one here. Again, it'll be interesting to see how this distribution is among the audience in the webinar today. 
Okay. Wow. So 92% see the health care right. That's excellent because that's going to, we're going to talk about that. That's wonderful because that's, you really being engaged with your provider. Um, family or friends about, uh, you know, not quite a third. Uh, online resources, Alpha and other websites, great. 78%. That's wonderful to see the people are reaching out for that advice and, and information. The media, about um, uh, 20%. And social media, a little over 10%. Very interesting uh, results there. So your healthcare team is important to asthma care, especially when there are viral illnesses exacerbating the asthma. This includes your primary care providers, could be a family physician, an internal medicine doctor, asthma specialists. Many of you will have asthma specialists who focus that's part of their training and board certification to really take care of asthma. And this can include allergy and asthma doctors, pulmonologists, medical assistants, office nurses, critical in the office to field calls, to triage, and to help you through the process. Advanced practice providers or APPs, these are nurse practitioners and physician assistants. These are well-trained uh, providers who can be extremely helpful in triage and, and treatment as well, seeing patients in the clinic. On-call services, very important. After hours clinics can be helpful to go in if the patient needs to be seen and hospital access, the emergency room, and unfortunately at times hospitalization. Next slide. So what do people with asthma need to know? They need to recognize common signs and symptoms of asthma that we mentioned previously. Need to identify when an asthma flare is occurring or an episode. Asthma action plans. It's great to have these are written plans developed with your healthcare provider and the patient. When you contact the healthcare provider or the asthma specialist, where do you go if asthma is worsening? Do you go to the clinic? Do you get directed to urgent care or should you go to the emergency room? These are all important decisions. And then other issues. Appropriate asthma medications need to be immediately available at home, at school, travel, etc. How to use inhalers inhaler technique, when to use a spacer, how to use a spacer, and appropriate follow-up care after, say, an urgent care visit. Should you go back to your healthcare provider? Certainly, to close the loop. And if you're in the hospital, definitely need to go back to your provider. Uh, next slide. So I have asthma and COVID or flu or RSV or all three of those. What do you do? Pay attention to symptoms, like we talked about earlier. Follow the written asthma action plan, and this will have ways to adjust medications as outlined by your provider or asthma specialist. Contact the appropriate healthcare provider, triaging for appropriate course of action, whether it be a visit in the office with an APP or nurse practitioner, physician assistant, the doctor, uh, dealing with your medical assistant and nurses. Urgent care uh, can be very helpful uh, after hours. Emergency room visits are necessary at times, and that doesn't mean you're going to be hospitalized, but more acute care can be given. And then appropriate follow-up care, closing that loop with your uh, primary care physician's office or healthcare provider. So I have asthma and COVID, flu, RSV, or all of, all of the above. What are the emergency warning signs? If these occur, you need to call 911 to go to the emergency room immediately. And this would be patients who are having increased trouble breathing or shortness of breath. Say it's, it is becoming more, more consistent or it's definitely worsening. Those, those are worrisome. Pain or pressure in the chest that does not go away with treatment. A patient who is newly confused, this is not good. You, this could mean there's more involvement of the asthma affecting other body systems. The patient cannot be awakened or stay awake. And then cyanosis, which is tissue color changes on mucous membranes like the lips, around the eyes, and fingertips. This can appear as white or grayish on darker skin tones or bluish or purplish on lighter skin. So let's go into medical therapy next. The written asthma action plan, I'm gonna show one in, the, in, in, a, in a slide in a little bit. So you have a written asthma action plan developed with your provider, then you have short-acting reliever medications. The most common example is albuterol. Most everyone's familiar with this, a short-acting reliever. Then there are long-acting controller medications. This can include inhaled corticosteroids, which are 
very, very important in asthma control. There are combination medications such as long-acting um, relievers that are connected to uh, inhaled corticosteroids, and then leukotriene modifiers. These can be used as controllers. And more, and more recently, in the last several years, there are biologic therapies to use for more moderate per persistent asthma patients in certain popula in certain categories. So these would be like Zolaire, Nucola, Depixent, and Tespire. Next slide. So a little a little uh, reiteration here. Following the asthma action plan. The quick relievers, these work quickly to relieve sudden symptoms. So you can take them as needed at the first sign of symptoms. Controller medications, these are again to control asthma by correcting the underlying changes in the asthma airway, such as swelling, increased mucus, and inflammation. Remember that illustration I showed earlier of the asthmatic airway. And they can be one or a combination of medicines. Then uh, the combinations of quick and controller medications into one inhaler. These med medicines are used for both short-term and control. So these are, these are uh, very important. And then the biologics, these are, are targeting a specific cell in the body or in the airway or protein to prevent swelling inside the airways and inflammation. And there are, these are for people with certain types of persistent asthma and are given by injection or infusion. So the written asthma action plan, so important. It is devised by the healthcare provider and the patient. So this is a shared sort of shared decision making about how this is gonna work for that individual patient. It should be written and it should have patient identification, information and specific instructions on how to use the plan. It should pro will provide an example in the next slide. And the, the AAP should be readily available again at home, uh, not only for the parents, but when you have babysitters come over, caregivers, and this could be the, like, like relatives coming over or in daycare, um, in, in preschool, in regular school, and other like, traveling and, uh, and, the, and such. So, so it should be readily available with the patient. Next slide. So here's an example of the asthma action plan from the Allergy and Asthma Foundation of America on the website. This is a, a great example of an AEP. So at the top, you have name, date, who's the, who's the doctor or provider. There's uh, the phone number of, the, of that provider, emergency contacts, the parents, caregivers, uh, doctor signature. Now in the right upper corner there, it, it gives the colors. This is like a stop a stoplight. The green means everything's good. It's a go. Use preventative medications. In the yellow zone, this is the cautionary area where something's happening. Maybe a viral illness started something. Using quick relief medicines and follow what to do with the controllers. And then the red zone is danger zone. This means you need to get help. Talking to your provider. Maybe needing to go to urgent care or the emergency room. So also, peak flows, peak flow rates can be built in here. These are devices where a patient can get a number for how their lungs are doing, and then you can use zones like in the green zone would be 80 to 100 percent peak flow rate zone, and then 60 to 80 percent in the yellow, and less than 60 percent in the red zone. So in the green zone means things are doing well, breathing is good, no call for wheeze. Um, sleep into the night, able to do exercise without problems. And the medicines here would be like albuterol. Maybe there's a controller, like an inhaled steroid or a leukotriene medicine. How much to use with the medication and how often. So, uh, and then asthma with exercise, to prevent that, you can use a, a short acting inhaler like albuterol uh, 10, to, 10 to 15 minutes before the activity. The cautionary zone or yellow zone, again, 60 to, to 80%. This is when there's first signs of a cold, like, like with COVID or with flu or with other viruses. Exposure to a known trigger like allergies or an irritant. Cough is, is getting worse. Mild, maybe mild wheezing, a tight chest, chest pain. Coughing at night where you weren't having coughing before. So with the medicines, then there could be some adjustments here from your provider, like using the short acting inhaler on a schedule three to four times a day maybe adjusting the inhaled corticosteroid, adding in some other controller. And here you should be talking with your uh, doctor's office or healthcare provider's office. Then there's the danger zone. This is where we don't want our patients, our individuals with asthma to be or our patients. 
the asthma is getting worse. Medicines aren't helping. Breathing is harder. Um, there's there, the airways aren't uh, opening up as well. Trouble speaking. Other asthma symptoms we discussed earlier. The peak flow rates would be below 60 to 50 percent. So here we're going to be adding definitely adding other controllers, maybe even an oral medication like prednisone, needing to go see the doctor or triaging to the ER, or maybe even hospitalization in some patients. So getting help from a healthcare provider immediately, talking to that office, it's important to contact the healthcare provider, going to the emergency room when necessary, do not waiting. So that's, this is the asthma action plan. That's why we're stressing it so much today. Next slide. So just a couple of sides on using uh, an inhaler and spacer. With an inhaler device, there are different types. There's a meter dose inhaler and a dry powdered inhaler. We'll focus here on meter dose inhalers, removing the cap, checking that the, if there's a dose counter, making sure there's medicine there, obviously, holding the inhaler upright and shaking it well, breathing out slowly and completely, not into the mouthpiece, and then placing the mouthpiece between the front teeth and sealing it with the lips around it. Next slide. So then starting to breathe in slowly through the mouth and at the same time pressing the inhaler down on the canister, counting, uh, continuing to breathe as that is going into the lungs and deeply and holding the breath and getting as far as you can into the lungs, holding for three to five seconds. Then removing the inhaler from the mouth, breathe out slowly and then repeat the dose if that's what your provider has prescribed with the inhaler. Uh, then with dry powdered inhalers, you're, you're taking a deep breath and activating the inhaler through the mouth, followed by a deep breath, holding the breath for about a count to 10, then exhaling. So next slide. What about a spacer? Spacers are very helpful to, to help decreasing that coordination problem with activating the inhaler and getting the medicine into the lungs. This is one device that can really be helpful here in improving the deposition or getting that medicine into the lungs where it needs to go. So it attaches to a meter dose inhaler. Um, it does not need to be used with a dry powder inhaler. So put the spacer between the teeth, close tightly and, and connect that to the inhaler. Keep your chin up, start breathing and slowly through the mouth and spray into the spacer by pressing down the inhaler. You can then breathe in slowly and as deeply as you can, and you can breathe through the spacer three to five times to get any residual medicine out of the spacer or reservoir into your lungs. And then again, that coordination problem is taken care of. Repeating based on the number of puffs to use as directed, and then cleaning the spacer, usually with soap and water and let it air dry to uh, make sure that, that medicine doesn't get built up in there and there's no contaminants. The one thing I didn't mention about the inhalers that I want to mention is if you haven't used it for a while, you can prime it by, by activating it a couple of times. Say you hadn't used it for a while, you want to just prime that inhaler to make sure you get medicine out. So best ways of prevention of asthma and asthma symptoms is to follow your asthma action plan, that written plan. Taking your asthma medications as prescribed and using over-the-counter medications if you need to use those in supplementing your asthma medication. Some people need to use topical nasal steroids because they have allergies and their nasal membranes are swollen and involved in the allergy process. Uh, uh, using decongestants, contacting the healthcare provider uh, office when needed to help triage, and then vaccinations. We're gonna talk about those um, in, in a little bit. So next slide. So what about prevention strategies? This is, this, this is preventing getting a viral illness that could then trigger your asthma symptoms. So it's important to consider and be immunized with appropriate uh, vaccines and boosters as recommended. Wash hands properly and often, wearing an appropriate face mask, uh, social distancing. How, how much have we heard about this over the last two and a half years? Very important. Covering mouth when coughing and cough, um, coughing into your arm or just so you're not spreading that virus to people, your individuals at home or, or work. 
current school. Staying home when you're ill. This is important so you're not actively spreading the virus, especially early on when the virus is really uh, replicating in your system and, and it can then be passed on through aerosol droplets to other people. Taking your asthma medications as directed and following the asthma action plan. Following up with your primary care provider, other healthcare providers as needed, may need to use telemedicine became a huge issue during the pandemic. So these are, these are visits with you being at home. Telemedicine with your provider can be very useful if you don't go into the office and maybe spread that virus to other people or to providers in the office. Next slide. Vaccines are available and with COVID-19, there are four vaccines available, one from Moderna, Pfizer, Janssen or Johnson & Johnson, the Novavax is, is more recent. These are, are have been approved, uh, FDA approved. There are certain uses. Most of you are very familiar, have been vaccinated, and they're important to prevent infection and to prevent utilization, like ER visits, hospitalizations, and even, even mortality. Influenza vaccines, so the, the more common ones are the quadrivalent flu shot, the in patients over 65. There are high dose influenza shots. There's a nasal spray uh, for influenza, and there's a recombinant. Uh, shot for influenza. Next slide. So other important issues to consider here, uh, vaccines are one of the safest and most effective health interventions available for fighting infectious diseases, not only for COVID influenza, but for the measles, for polio, diphtheria, tetanus. Think about many of these diseases that you may have been present uh, many years ago in my lifetime, I've certainly seen these diseases and many of these have been um, eradicated or have been taken care of to, to most extent in uh, over the years with, with good vaccinations. These are fundamental in the eradication control of many formerly devastating diseases such as polio, meningitis, pneumonia, and, and others. Be aware that there are many myths and untruths about about vaccines that we have to consider and we us as health providers have to educate our patients we get these questions some some myths are listed here there's no real need for vaccines vaccines have harmful side effects and cause illnesses uh, giving multiple vaccines can increase the risk of harmful side effects these are just a few examples of, of things that we get posed to us that we have to educate our our patients and families about there is there are rare cars, rare causes of inflammation of the heart or myocarditis have been reported after receiving a second dose of COVID, certain COVID uh, mRNA vaccines, mainly the Moderna vaccine. This has mainly occurred in males greater than 16. And this is an area of active investigation. And we'll know more and more about this as we go forward. But this is an area I bring up because you may have heard about this in the media or from your providers. Next slide. So the next polling question we're gonna review here is, how are you going to protect yourself? And this could, in, again, select all that apply here. How are you gonna protect yourself from getting a viral illness that could then impact you, not only just with your daily activities, but if you have asthma? Good, so we're gonna see um, polling results here. Wearing a mask, about a third of the attendees um, would do that to protect themselves. Getting vaccinated, about a third. Getting a flu vaccine, a third. Practicing social distancing, a third. And then all the above, great, 80%. Because all of these things can be helpful as we mentioned. So 80% of the attendees would do all the above, which is very reassuring to me because all those things can help. Next slide. Dr. James, okay. thank you so much. Would you like to start with a few words before we jump into the resource slide? No, I, th I think it's what we're trying to do is give you a sort of a framework to deal with these this triple demic and it can be all three of those or maybe one of those and how it might impact asthma and give you logical and really uh, evidence-based ways to deal with those 
illnesses to prevent exacerbations, prevent hospitalizations and other morbidities. So I hope that this has given you that framework and uh, thank, thanks again for attending. Absolutely, Dr. James, I know I learned so much today from your presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. And I do know this is being recorded and we will be able to send it out to everyone after so that they can go back and reference or go back to those questions, those wonderful questions that we see in the Q&A coming in. Um, keep those coming, those are fantastic. So really great conversation and we're gonna continue this conversation. So, but first I'm gonna give you a second to just catch your breath and I'm gonna go over a few resources that AFA has to offer, like our educational materials and our tools that you can download for free at your convenience. Things such as the asthma action plan that Dr. James was showing and talking about today. It is so important to your healthcare and your family's healthcare. We want to encourage you to go to that site, afa.org backslash store, and download that asthma action plan. Bring that to your next healthcare provider's office on your next visit. It is so important to your health. Also, we want to point out, did you guys know that we have a support center? We absolutely do. And it's available Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have a question at any time about asthma, allergy, or another related condition, you can send it into our support center or you can call someone who will triage the call and answer your questions appropriately and point you in the direction of a community service or referral if needed. That number is 1-800-727-8462. It's a really great resource and I would definitely earmark that for the future. We want you guys to be a part of our AFA community. Join us online. These online forums are for asthma and allergy support or food allergy support. You can connect with other members across the country managing the same type of condition that you have. Our online communities are available 24 seven and they are always moderated by experienced staff. Another great resource is our learning catalog. We have online courses and resources all about asthma, allergy, food allergies for patients, families, healthcare providers, you name it, we got it. These courses are self-paced so you can move through the lessons at your own convenience. We really encourage you to check those out too. One of my favorite resources though is Ask the Allergist. This is where you can submit a question online to our board certified allergists. They will answer your questions about managing asthma or allergies, medications and treatments. You can also search the online database for frequently asked questions about asthma and allergies. But remember, Ask the Allergist does not answer specific questions about specific consumer products, and it is definitely not a substitute for your medical advice from your physician. But it is a really great resource to have on hand. Finally, learn more about our asthma and allergy friendly certification program. You can learn more about products such as filters, mattress covers, and more and you can check out where they got this certification, how and where to buy these products. So these are wonderful resources that we want to encourage you to explore now and in the future. So Dr. James, get ready for our question and answer portion of the program. Are you ready? Perfect. Yeah, let's go. All right, let's get started. Zulima, you ready? Yes, All right. I'm ready. Let's have our first question and answer. Dr. James, we received uh, several questions. So the first earlier you mentioned anxiety, and we know that some asthma symptoms overlap with anxiety symptoms. So can you please elaborate on this? Absolutely. So think about, so if you're having these symptoms of asthma, cough, wheezing, chest tightness, uh, problems with exercise, well, that, those are going to be symptoms you see. But in addition to that, well, that certainly can bring on anxiety in patients that are at school. They're, they're not able to, to participate in their schoolwork at night when you're having asthma symptoms. That can increase anxiety. Going to um, family gatherings, parties, et cetera, you're, you're anxious because you're having these symptoms. You're not able to participate fully in that activity. Uh, also, I mean, it, it, with a lot of diseases, it, 
anxiety can be increased. Um, the food allergy is all over the media in terms of this right now. So it, it, it's, it's a condition that can affect your, those symptoms, bring on those symptoms, but in addition can cause some you know, other problems with how you deal with those symptoms and anxiety is such a common anxiety and fear of what's gonna happen. You're gonna end up in the emergency room in the hospital. Well, that, that was just, that's just part of the dealing with that disease. Definitely. Our next question is, is the annual flu shot and COVID-19 booster recommended for, pa for as a patient, sorry? Yes, this is a very common clinical question we get. Uh, and yes, this, it, it is recommended. Um, asthma patients, as we talked about in this program, are in the higher risk group when they get uh, COVID-19. And, and flu has been a traditional one that asthma patients can have trouble more trouble than a normal person when they get these viral illnesses. So we have vaccinations available that the, the flu shot has been available for years and it, it is an annual uh, immunization that's given in the fall typically before say uh, before Christmas I would say and that can be a preventative measure for not everyone gets you know a, a positive response it does they still might get the flu but the risk benefit is so in favor of the asthmatic to get that shot and the same i would say for covid-19 covid-19 is going to be could cause more problems for an asthma patient so we have vaccinations that are available that are safe and the risk benefit is much in the favor uh, benefit favor for that patient so that they don't get a bad asthma exacerbation that could land in the urgent care emergency room or hospital or even in some cases uh, fatality. So that, that's important to understand the risk benefit of why we do these immunizations and they, they are very safe and effective. Our next question is, how can you tell the difference between a flu, asthma, COVID-19 or cold cough? Okay, so if you recall that one really busy slide I showed that had the symptoms on the left-hand side and then the, the, the different um, columns for the different diseases. So I guess I would, for asthma, some of the things I pointed out to you were the chest pain and chest tightness in addition to the cough. The asthma being a, a disease that can come, come and go throughout the year, depending on your triggers. Um, COVID-19 is going to be during those times of the year when the when COVID is mostly present, the fall to the winter months. COVID also can have, in addition to cough, can have those, those changes in smell and taste, those GI symptoms. Um, you can have fever, but with a cold or an upper respiratory infection, you could also have a fever. So that's not always the best determination. So if you recall those, that chart and I would recommend if you can get that and you can even take it to your provider because they might not even know about it. And you can have that as a way to discriminate those all those different uh, diseases, including allergies not on here. It is a helpful guide to discriminate those different problems based on symptoms. And as a reminder, that table that Dr. James is referencing was shared earlier in the chat. It is a great table that is very helpful. Um, our next question is, can asthma patients manage a viral infection at home by themselves, or is it safe to visit a doctor? Okay, this is, this is a great question. So I would say that if an asthma patient is fully controlled and then they get the viral illness, whether it be COVID-19, the flu, RSV, or, or rhinovirus, whatever. If they are controlled and they're having mild, very mild symptoms of a viral illness, like they're not having significant fever, they're having a runny nose, congestion, they're not feeling so great, they can, if they have their asthma action plan and they can follow that and things are going well, they're on their medications, they should be taking those medications we talked about, their controller and their reliever, those patients can be can be monitored at home and taken care of. But once those symptoms become more involved and their, their medications aren't controlling their symptoms, their warning flags in that yellow zone, um, then they need to be talking to their doctor and deciding what's the triage step. Do they 
go to their doctor's office? Do they go to urgent care? Or do they go to the emergency room? So it, again, it depends on that. Now that's why that action plan is so important. We talked about having an asthma action plan with, with peak flow rates in some patients, knowing how to use the medications, how the medications are adjusted, and knowing when to call. I, I would have a low threshold to call the doctor's office. That would be my recommendation. Have a low threshold to call the your healthcare provider's office and get direction from the nurses, the the nurse practitioner or physician assistant, or the doctor about what steps to take, staying at home, coming into the office, or going to emergency room. Absolutely. Our next question is, should I discontinue my asthma medications while I am sick with the flu, RSV, or COVID-19? Okay, I hope this is an obvious, very obvious answer. No, you should not discontinue your asthma, asthma medication. So if what's in your action plan or what you've been prescribed, if, whether it be, you know, a contr whatever controller medication you're using and the quick relief medication, continue to do those medications. Now you may need to do the adjustments in the yellow zone we talked about, definitely in the red zone. So you do not stop your asthma medications when you're sick with the flu because they can be so important in controlling symptoms and preventing a worsening attack or, or, or utilization to the emergency room, hospitalization or other morbidities. Yes, absolutely. Very important. Uh, and our next question is, can you talk more about the flu vaccines and why they work better some years than others? Sure. So traditionally, the influenza vaccine, how they, they have different strains put into the vaccine each year. And they the, the groups, the infectious disease groups, the national groups and, and around the world, they just they have to predict from a, from what's happening around the world what might be prevalent in the United States during the fall and winter. So they pick the most prevalent strains and put those into the vaccine in the hopes that it will prevent. If you get the flu, it's going to get those strains and prevent the the um, the infection. So we know that the flu vaccine is not always. 100% effective. It may only be 50 to 60% effective because we don't always predict those strains appropriate. They just, we just, it's, you know, it's beyond what we can do to predict the right, correct strains each time. But there, they, in some years, it's, this year was predicted pretty, pretty closely, whereas other years it may not be. So it's, you know, it's, we do the best we can using the available information and, and a lot of resources to do that. I would like to mention that there is work being done on a universal flu vaccine. And this would be wonderful because this would be a vaccine that would be used each year to prevent the strains of flu that cause the, the disease. This would be, I mean, this is something that's been worked on and worked on and, and getting closer to that, but this would be something that would be absolutely wonderful if we had that available to give each fall to prevent the flu. Our next question is, I am seeing Flovent being ordered as a rescue medication with albuterol. Why? Okay, so this would go back to that one side I was talking about controller medications. You have maybe using Flovent as your controller uh, in the past, and that's still a good thing to do because it's an inhaled corticosteroid. But there are also products now that have the inhaled corticosteroid in combination with a long acting bronchodilator. So uh, the one that is probably the most was initially was um, was uh, Simbacor, which is budesonide, which is like Flovent, and it's connected to the long acting uh, bronchodilator. So those, those that one, the one medication has two medis medications in there and it's called, it can be used as a controller, which is what it's mainly used for, but it can also be used as a reliever. In patients who are doing well, they get it in the yellow zone, they can, we can use that to, to give both quick relief and improve the, the long-term control. So, and some patients may just have that combination inhaler as their one medication. So you may have, you may have heard about this. Some of, your, some of you may be on this, or you have children that are on this with asthma. So that's what this question is getting to is um, it, 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 you can have a, a combination inhaler 
and and doing two things, uh, not just one. Our next okay. question. If my young huh? child, can, oh boy, if my young child catches respiratory syndrome virus, what is the risk for me as an adult with mm -hmm. asthma? So if you're, I, I think this question is asking if if an adult has asthma and then their child in the home catches RSV. I, I think that's how I'm reading this question. So, well, certainly that RSV virus is, your child has it, the RSV is, your child has it, but it can also be expressed into the environment. Well, if the adult has asthma, they have a, a they're at risk for catching that virus and that could exacerbate their asthma. So, you know, they're in the home, you, got, you can do measures in the home the best you can, wearing masks, washing hands, uh, but, but you can't, you know, it's hard to do um, you can't, you're, if you're living in one home, well, you can only do so much, but there is a risk for that adult patient with asthma catching RSV and that exacerbating their asthma. And we talked about preventative measures in, at length in, in one of the slides. The next question is, are people who get COVID-19 more likely to develop asthma in the future? So this is a an er, this is certainly a, an area of, of investigation. I can't give a specific you know, like rate or percentage that has happened. But in general, people who get COVID-19 don't go on to develop, if they didn't have asthma, don't go on to develop asthma for the rest of their life. But there are some patients who develop COVID that then can get what's called long COVID and they can have problems with the lungs for, for they have continued to have problems with COVID. They can have not just with the lungs, but with other neurologic symptoms and gastrointestinal symptoms. So there's a chance that they could develop asthma in the future. But in, but I'll tell you the basic answer would be people who, who don't have asthma, who get COVID-19, they're not sort of at higher risk to just all of a sudden develop asthma. But pay attention to this area, because this is an area of, of, of high and hot research right now that we'll have more information in the future. Absolutely. Our next question is, what do we know so far about COVID-19's long-term impact on asthma? Okay, so if if COVID-19, if, if you have asthma, this is maybe different from the previous question. Well, if you have COVID and you're treated appropriately, then you may, it may not impact your asthma to make it worse, you may have your you're going to have your asthma and you're going to have chances to have asthma exacerbations like cough wheeze shortness of breath chest tightness etc but if if you're if you're if the asthma if, the, if your covid runs its course or you get the immunization this is an important part of this if you get immunized well you could prevent the covid and it wouldn't have a long-term impact on your asthma so uh you know it's i, I think the sort of like the previous question if COVID is, it could make your asthma worse. We know that from what we talked about, but if you're treated and you go on to treat your asthma, then you could be in under good control for a long period of time. Our next question is, what has the pandemic taught us about limiting the transmission of respiratory illnesses? Okay, so what we've learned, I think, is learned some common sense approaches to how do we prevent transmission. And this, I think more than anything, this COVID pandemic has taught us about the importance of proper and appropriate hand washing, proper use of face masks. And, and we know this based on using face masks at schools, sporting events, on airplanes. I mean, th this has been very helpful to prevent the spread, using them when you're going out to social activities. Uh, so face masks, social distancing. How many times have you heard that over the last two and a half years? Well, uh, separating by say six feet at when you're going to the grocery store, when you're going to um, your doctor's office. And it's not always easy to do this, but if you can think about that, it, it's important. Staying home when you're sick. I mean, this, is, this is, pertains to not only children, but adults who how many times did you switch your work from going to home at work? I mean, working from home has been a huge thing. Telemedicine. Um, people are starting to go back to work now, but but still a lot of people are working from home, and that helped to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, getting immunized, 
I mean, how I, I can I talked about that in the presentation. So all of those things can help prevent, and we've learned and been stressed in uh, preventing respiratory viral illnesses. Thank you so much, Dr. James. Those were some incredible questions that were sent in and that facilitated a lot of really great and rich discussion. And I hope we continue that conversation as we move on in the future. So please feel free to send us an email, send us some questions, anything that you would like to continue that conversation with. And Dr. James, Zulima, thank you so much for your time today as we went through this webinar. I know it was incredibly informational and informative, um, and, we, and we hope to hear more in the future from you guys. So with that, thank you. Thank you to our audience for participating. Dr. James, are there any last words before we leave for the day? No, I'm just thank, again, thank the Asthma and Allergy Foundation for the work that they do and for putting on this important uh, webinar and I want to thank again the audience for participating taking time out of your day and me, all the many questions I'm sure we have many more that are going to come to to AFA from this webinar thank thanks everyone we absolutely do and we will follow up be on the lookout for that email in the next few days thanks so much everyone have a great afternoon